welcome to this review of my Apple MO110A. This one is from 1986, which is the year it was first made, by the way. I got it off eBay for £23 shipped off of some keycap money I'd made, and it had only been on for 20 minutes or so, but it's a good price, especially because it's in fantastic condition, and it came with the original cable, which doesn't even look like it's been used. This keyboard came with the Macintosh Plus not long after the original Mac. The original Mac came with a similar but smaller keyboard. It didn't have the numpad and it lacked arrow keys because Steve Jobs wanted to bully developers into using the mouse instead. And they left out the numpad so that they could sell you a separate one for what would today be well over $200. When they released this updated model, Jobs had already been fired though, so they brought back the arrow keys and a numpad, which certainly helps a lot. Jobs also had the wires in the original connector crossed so that you couldn't just buy a 50 pence telephone cable as a replacement and had to buy a proprietary Apple connector cable instead. A little trick that Apple still keep pulling to this very day. Anyway, Apple criticism aside, this one was apparently incompatible with a phone jack and Tom, aka Hizzer, who also made my AEK converter, was nice enough to buy one up for me for this one as well and program the layout according to my specifications. I already mentioned that the layout was an expansion of the original using arrow keys and the numpad and it has UK layout in the sense that it has a pound sign instead of a hash sign here. But other than that it's pretty much the normal international layout. The numpad has the standard Apple arrangement which includes an equals key here which is very useful for me. It has no secondary legends or a numlock key, so I'm assuming it was originally not capable of nav commands like page up, page down, home end, insert and delete, but it doesn't have buttons for that elsewhere. I rely a lot on them though, so I had this clear button programmed to be numlock, just so that I could toggle between num and nav commands. Sounds complicated, but I'm kind of used to it. I've had it on other boards too, just a shame the keyboard doesn't have a lock light for it. The F keys, F1 through F12, I had programmed as a function layer over these keys using the right bracket key as an FN key. When you press it, it outputs a bracket, and when you hold it down, it functions as an FN key. That was one of Tom's clever ideas. FN also turns this from escape into the tilde key shown on the keycap. It turns backspace into print screen and numlock into scroll lock, which is a Microsoft Excel user I use somewhat regularly. The nav is not the usual T nav, which became popular slightly later. It's an L shaped nav instead. So you have left and right next to each other and up and down on top of each other. And at first this seems fairly logical. And in fact, having the up key here is not really the end of the world. It's easier to get used to than you think. But one thing is a bit hard to get used to and it's not something that you might notice unless you use this keyboard for a while. See, having up and down across from each other seems very reasonable, but it does mean that the right key is not on the right anymore. So quite often when I want to go down I press right and when I want to go right I press down. Still overall the layout is not that outlandish. The keys are all pretty much where they belong so it's fairly decent and suits me well enough. Although the absence of dedicated F keys is still a pain in the ass when you're playing Diablo. It was made by Alps Electric in a US plant and like just about everything else Alps made it's very well built. Despite its small size, it weighs more than a G83000 and it feels very dense and unyielding. The case is thick, very tough plastic and it's got absolutely no flex in the case whatsoever, which is amazing. Even the Model M, Model F and Northgate OmniKey have at least a little bit of flex in them. The entire cable is coiled, but it's also very thin and not very long, but it does stretch quite well as you can see. There are no feet on the keyboard other than these rubber pads here. In fact I'm not sure Apple ever made any keyboards with feet on it. Other than that bizarre monopod and the AEK2 of course. The keyboard is really tall though so if you use it normally like this your wrists will be at quite a steep angle and you can get cramps pretty quickly. Fortunately, alongside this massive stack of old IBM floppies, I found this at the recycling center, two brand new adjustable wrist rests from a long time ago. They make the keyboard much more comfortable to use. They're very nice. And the box even has a Model M on it, see? The company who made them is called Rubbermaid, by the way, which sounds like they originally made inflatable sex dolls or something. 
Anyway, overall, the build quality of this keyboard is superb. It uses ALPS SKCC switches. The switches ALPS put into keyboards before the SKCL and SKCM series, which is what this video trilogy is about. These switches came in several variations, but this is one of the most common types, the tall cream variations. These switches are linear, and they're quite similar in construction to their later SKCL switches. They featured an identical switch blade, which was black for most of them, but this is a quite young factory surplus one, so it uses the later grey switch plates instead. The slider is much taller though, and it uses a T mount rather than the bar mount that ALP switches would later be well known for. There's also much less free space inside the switch housing. Most notably though, these switches are known for producing a very loud ringing sound. Although this is also a factor of the chassis they're mounted in, even just pressing the loose switch gives out a quite noticeable ping, much, much louder than the later SKCL switches, even though some SKCL boards also ping quite loudly as well. Here is an up-close recording of the sound of one of these SKCC switches. You can quite clearly hear the pinging noise in this. Although they're linear switches, the key feel isn't actually fully linear. There is a tiny tactile bump as the slider clears the switch plate. It's very subtle, you can barely feel it while typing, but it's there and it's much more apparent when you press the keys very slowly. All ALP switches with a switch plate like this have this tactile bump by the way. The feel is very smooth buttery smooth even. In fact, it literally feels like you're pressing the keycap through a stick of soft, warm, melted butter. Oh, yeah. They are fairly stiff though. I don't know the exact weighting, but I know it's too heavy for my liking. Fortunately, like the SKCL and SKCM switches, the actuation point is high up in the key travel, so you can get away with not hammering the keys too much. Overall, they're pretty nice. If you like linear and don't mind stiff, these should be right up your alley, as long as you can tolerate the ping, of course. The caps lock key has a latching switch, by the way. The latching mechanism inside the switch leaves no room for a return spring, so they put it on the outside instead. But unlike other switches with external springs, it is actually threaded through the slider, which is a very elegant way to keep it in place. Here you can see it just poking out through the other side. It's very stiff, but it's also pretty smooth for a latching switch. Like most switches from the early 80s, the keycaps use a proprietary cross mount that's not MX compatible. They're made out of thick PBT and they have nice die sublimed legends. And if you look at the underside of the keycap, you can see that the strange brown gray color on them is actually their natural color. They haven't yellowed. The spacebar has yellow though, as it's made out of ABS instead, and it's taken on a deep ochre like color. The caps are really very nice, and I think Alps made them themselves. The keycaps on the modifier keys are even thicker. Look at that! That must be a record of thick PBT. Interestingly, just like later Dell keyboards, the keycaps on the bottom row are all convex, instead of just the spacebar. Final verdict? This is a pretty nifty little thing, really. The switches are too heavy for me, but they're smooth, so it's not unpleasant to use them, even for me. They're not too hard to find and not all that expensive either, so if you're curious, go for it. If you like 60% layouts, you can even go for the original M0110, which is pretty much exactly the same, except with some of the useful bits chopped off. That's it for this review. I hope you enjoyed this video, and stay tuned for part 2 next week, where we look at how ALP switches progress from here. Following is a typing demonstration of me typing on this keyboard.